on present mode. So hopefully everyone can still see that. Yes, perfect. perfect. Yes. Awesome. So hi, <laughs> my name is Dean Frank Reynolds. Um, I'm an accessibility consultant. I live in Cramlington, but business was set up and started in Newcastle um, about a year and a half, two years ago now. Um, and yeah, so today I'm just going to chat a little bit about what it is I do, why I do the things I do, and the fact without sounding too big headed, I suppose, where I think some people might be getting accessibility wrong and why you might be a little bit afraid of it. So we'll start with um, me. Um, unfortunately, that's not a picture of me. I don't have that nice hair. Um, I try, but then lockdown happens and then it just keeps flopping back over on itself. But yes, so oh, it's just too much there. It's like, I was so lucky to get a haircut, I think the day before the latest lockdown, but even now it's just driving me crazy. So yeah. Lots of side tangents today, apologies in advance. Um, I'm kind of good at those. So Dean Frank Reynolds, that's me. And accessibility consultant, I suppose, is what other people call me. And it's the easiest way to get um, what I can do for businesses or charities or just people who want to know more about accessibility in a really short, concise way. Um, I don't like the word accessibility consultant just because it sounds too formal and it just isn't me. but with a recent rebrand and some recent thinking, I've kind of gone with your accessibility guide because that's what I feel like the role really is. It's about guiding, you know, you could be a sole trader, you could be a massive international charity, and I've seen it happen. There, there are mistakes being made at so many levels because people just aren't really sure where to start. Um, so I much prefer the new rebrand and the new name of a guide, but again, consultant is just that really short form um, as to why you know, what, what do you do, the elevator pitch, or just a term that people know. Um, as to how I got to where I am today, um, you wouldn't necessarily know from my voice, but I'm profoundly deaf. So that means I use BSL and lip reading to communicate. Um, I have some very nice fancy hearing aids that let me plug into three different things into a computer to try and get by, but ultimately um, I'm classed as profoundly deaf. So that's been, due to a condition called many years disease since I was born. Uh, wasn't diagnosed until I was 21. And another quick side tangent, until I was 21, I thought that the floor moved for everybody when they got a bit dizzy. It's just such a random thing. I'd grown up with it and I just was like, yeah, you know when you get dizzy and the floor starts to undulate? And it looks like it's far away and it's going back and it's moving like a river. And everybody just kind of looked at me and was like, <laughs> no. And then so it turns out what I was describing and what I can track back all the way to nursery even is um, is a visual disturbance because of Meniere's disease. It's not quite a hallucination because my brain wasn't making up anything, but it was compensating um, and therefore causing visual disturbances. So yeah, until I was 21, I thought everybody did that when they got dizzy. Spoilers, they don't. It's just, you know, people with, with similar inner ear problems. Um, and then from there, um, always had a massive impact growing up, and a massive impact and interest in design, um, sp specifically posters and something called motion graphics. And throughout my time at college specifically, I focused on design and accessible design because nobody else was. There wasn't a thing, um, you know, as a deaf kid or deaf person, deaf man, whatever you want to use. I didn't really get anything from um, from what you would say radio or TV adverts. There just wasn't, there wasn't anything that hooked me in. Um, and then as the internet and social media picked up, it was the same. Um, there was no subtitles, there's no captioning, and it's, technology is great, but not at the risk of excluding people. Um, so I guess I've always lived with that and tried to make a difference with design and with my ideas since, since uni, well, since college and then university. Um, I went off to university, it was the first time, like anybody living away from home, and unfortunately the uni I went to um, didn't have any support for disabled kids, which wasn't great. So I'd gone from being on top of the world, an amazingly supported college with a portfolio and a resume and an interest in all things accessible design, to being plonked alone in a student flat with people I didn't know on a course that quite frankly, didn't even bother to give me subtitles. Um, I remember once walking in and it was, today we're gonna watch a documentary on, uh, I don't even know, I didn't even get the guy's name, but it was um, it was a documentary on some famous designer and I just left. 
it was like a two hour documentary and I just walked out of the class. And that was one of the last times um, that I, I was in that course. And so I had to leave university. And so I've done two years of uni uh, at two separate universities as a result, uh, all based around graphic design and, and wanting to raise the bar of accessibility uh, within education. Um, because really throughout university and college, accessibility was only mentioned twice, once in each. In college, it was mentioned for five days on a small sort of what about disabled people segment. And at university, it was part of um, an introduction to design and that's it. It's never spoken about again. So from there, I moved on to um, sort of a different role, a different time in my life after picking myself up after uni. I went after my other love, which being a massive nerd and geek meant computers and IT. And I spent four years working from home, uh, way before it was fashionable, way before everyone did it. Um, I was working from home in IT and I was helping support infrastructure, IT, all over, all over the world. Uh, one of my favorite clients was in um, Australia, for example. So that was a great job. And I thought it was going to be a career. And for me, it gave me that perspective of problem solving. I found that the way that I approached people's problems was a little bit different. Um, maybe because I was a big nerd, maybe because I had a different experience. Um, so yeah, so I got on really well with that role. And unfortunately, another facet of many years disease, apart from falling over all the time and being really clumsy, is, um, is your hearing drops quite sort of in different stages. So as part of that, uh, three and a half years into that role, um, I had a drop from mild into severe. And severe was bad enough um, to, to mean that I could no longer use a telephone. So that puts me in my mid twenties. So um, a few years back, there was just no way of me actually being able to use a telephone. The hearing aids I had at the time went up to the job. Um, the NHS sort of kept stringing me along and you know I having been a child who grew up with the NHS and with the audiology I appreciate and understand the focus put into children and making sure that children have the best hearing aids and the best tech available and you sort of get to 18 and maybe you don't need it quite so much um, unfortunately you know that's the way the cookie crumbles and that's the way you know funding has to go in the NHS so as a result, I had to leave that job because I could no longer, as my boss put it, um, fulfill the role as, as an IT um, technician. Um, I tried to argue the fact that, well, really, it's one sort of fifth of my job. The rest of the time, I'm literally in people's computers, looking at servers, solving problems, just being a nerd and doing my job. I can do that without the need to, to hear. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't see it the same way. And I can sort of paraphrase, it's not fair to everybody else if you don't do that part of the work. So they considered it more fair that I lose a career and a passion and an interest than to, you know, not even give me special treatment, but just allow me to thrive in a different way. Um, we'll skip forward a bit as well. And then my next attempt at a career was, um, was actually um, supporting people just like myself. So supporting people... Oof, I'm going to say 16 to 30 who were um, actually trying to find employment, go back into education after a gap. Um, it could be for disability, it could be mental health, it could have been having children, it could have been, you know, for a whole range of different reasons. And again, that role allowed me to thrive in that problem solving bit. But also, um, increasingly, I was finding that um, this is a sort of Again, the way it works behind the scenes, I was the disabled guy, so I get a lot of disabled caseload. It's, yeah, it's the way that it works. So I ended up working with a couple of deaf people, and I was obviously the only one who could sign in any way. So we'd all get together again in the days pre-COVID where you could actually get together with people. Uh, kind of forgetting what that feels like, but way back then we would get together and we'd sign and we were talking about... Um, the issues that everybody was coming across and time and time again it was coming back to the employers just don't know what to do with me you know we turn up for job interviews we turn up for no matter what the job we turn up for it and it's just they don't know and it sort of really started to open my eyes and make me realize that it wasn't just a me problem there was nothing wrong with me it wasn't because i couldn't lip read enough it wasn't because i wasn't trying hard enough that systemically there was a problem here um and again, really got into this role, really started to carve out what I thought was gonna be a career of helping people. 
uh, supporting them one to one. Um, and then <laughs> three years ago, just for fun, um, I went in for two major operations on my abdomen. Uh, abdomen. Uh, words are hard. Um, and I ended up getting um, permanent nerve damage and kind of problems with scar tissue and muscle damage in my core. So I went from being just deaf, which is, you know, as fun as it sounds, into um, all sorts of these new physical symptoms that I'd never had before. Um, so I spent sort of a year trying to recover from that. Um, spoilers, I was let go from that other job again because it wasn't fair for me to work from home when I couldn't walk. <laughs> um, and you know, it's, it's that echo again, but you know, if, if we can go on a quick tangent, now I know all that team has worked from home for the past year and a half because of COVID and because of office restructuring. So again, none of the solutions that I do in my job are necessarily new. They were just solutions and ideas that either weren't thought of or maybe weren't available to disabled people before. So yeah, lots of lots of bitterness and anger and I had to learn a, a lot in a short amount of time. Um, and that led me to where I am today is, is really a culmination of that creativity, that design, that passion for wanting things to not only look better, but feel better combined with the IT and the problem solving. And then also the idea that I was able to support people in lots of different ways. Um, and just in the last sort of sort of few months, working with Jonathan has meant that I'm able to actually physically do more, which is amazing. Um, I remember when I first got together um, with the OTs and, and with this team and was trying different types of crutches and different types of wheelchair, I had lost the muscle mass, so I couldn't physically propel myself. So it was this great solution where I was thinking, okay, I've been in bed for about eight months at this point. I'm starting physio, I'm starting pain management. I've got all these drugs coursing through me. I want to do something. And yeah, it was another slap in the face when it was like, oh, I don't actually even have the strength to propel myself now. So that was about two years ago. Um, and then after I started to get a bit stronger, one of the first things I did was, was decide that I wasn't going to allow um, functionally able-bodied people to tell me that what I couldn't couldn't do anymore, um, and combine all of the years of my experience and passion and knowledge in, into what I do today. And the rest of the slides are kind of like cut up versions of, of some of some of the research that I've been a part of, some of the research that I've done. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of these now. Um, you know, there are 600 approximate numbers, but 600,000 vegans in the UK. Yet Greg's launched as a pasty just for vegans. But we can't get into old Greg shops, but that doesn't matter because 14 million disabled people mean less than 600,000 vegans. Um, 2.4 million LGBT uh, people around the UK, people who identify within the spectrum. And again, how many companies can you think of who go rainbow for Pride Month, who like to talk about inclusivity, but kind of again exclude the 14 million disabled people? Um, 1.8 million students, you know, how many of those students are going to have accessible accommodations? Uh, spoilers, not many. Um, and then the 5.4 million over 75s. Again, I'm sure I'm not the only one that can think of over 75 concessions in terms of, um, you know, whether it's a TV license or, or whether it's bus pass and travel or whether it's, you know, the ability to, to get more support from the community, for example. Um, and yeah, the 14 million disabled people in the UK and the representation the is just not there. Um, quick slide on something called the Purple Pound, if you haven't already heard of it. It's just the idea that disabled people, their friends and families add about 212 billion pounds to the UK economy every year. Um, that's a huge margin for businesses. Um, it's a huge margin if you own a business. It's a huge margin if you are a disabled person. It's just that is the economic factor of, of people put into numbers. Um, and this is the bit where I kind of chat a bit more about um, accessibility and inclusion and where I think people go wrong. It, it's a scary, confusing topic. And time and time again, people, you know, use the word and they don't really know what that means. 
Um, sometimes I've got a meme in here, but I wasn't sure on my audience, so I took the memes out. Um, so yes, yeah, so sometimes there's a meme and it says you keep using that word and I don't think you know what it means. Um, and yeah, this, I'd like to think that nobody's doing this from a place of persecution. Nobody's doing this from a place um, of deliberate exclusion. It, it's more from a place of fear or lack of education or lack of awareness. This is one of my favorite definitions of the word accessible. Um, objective. Um, I had to look up what that was. It's been a long time since I was in school. But easy to approach, reach, enter, speak with, or use. Something that can be used, entered, or reached. That's it. That's that's the that's what accessible means. Um, so I, I'm going to boil that down. To accessibility means something is easy or easy to use. Inclusive means everybody. So when I'm when I'm raising awareness and I'm giving these talks, I really try and narrow it down to nothing more than being accessible and being inclusive is just an aim for being easier for everybody. And it doesn't matter what kind of business you're running. Doesn't matter if it's a kick charity, large or small, a shoe shop versus a restaurant or a huge international office. It really doesn't matter. There are things that everyone can do to become easier, whether it's for your customers, your clients, your colleagues, even the community that you're a part of. There's, there's a lot of work and a lot of easy things that can be done. Um, this is probably a little bit more of the technical slide, but I, I liked it because it, it broke down where I think we are with, with accessibility. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my um, mouse cursor. Yes, you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, compliance is where we start with. Everybody's afraid of being sued or afraid of you know being caught out. Um, but then we go into this is new field that I really like, and it's user experience. So it's around UX. So it's around making sure that again everybody who uses your service, buys your product, uses your website, comes across your social, whatever it means, they're actually able to. To do it easily they have the best possible experience for working with you um and then there's we're getting to more physical stuff with made for me um so for example 3d printing is a huge part of this um i've 3d printed a couple of brackets for my wheelchair with some friends that i have and it's just so i can hook some drinks on there i can just have a can and just put it on the side of my wheelchair and it's fine I don't need to, you know, I don't need to go buy a new wheelchair. I don't need to go in. I can have it made for me. And then finally, we get to the human experience, which is what I kind of think all good design and all good levels of business really ought to be focusing on. But then people get so trapped and so worried about this first little step compliance that they never even make it anywhere near humans. <laughs> Just you're so worried about some some W3C, some WCAG rules. You're so worried about the fine print and, you know, you, you know, you just miss it. You miss the forest for the trees. You don't, you're so focused on this one little bit that you don't see the rest. Um, one thing that I sort of talk about a lot is the idea around um, equality, equity, and justice. And people sort of think this is kind of a, a bit of a meme -y picture as well that's used often in, in, in and around the field. The idea is that equality by itself in that example gives everybody the same thing everybody has a box now we can look at that after the fact and see well the tall person didn't need a box the person in the middle yeah they could have done with a box and then the next person didn't get enough now that's it, it could be a look at how my previous businesses tried to treat everybody with equality you know a, and I'm sure you can think of many sort of experiences yourselves but the idea is that treating everyone equally doesn't mean everybody gets what they need. It means you think everybody gets what they need. Um, then we've got equity in the middle here, which is is about taking what you have, so using what you have. So in equity, in the first screen, there were three boxes available. Everybody got a box. Everyone should be happy, but really that's not how the world works. Number two was taking those three boxes and thinking about what you do with them, thinking about what you have right now and using it properly. So, or using it most effectively. So the tall person didn't need a box. The middle person did need a box. The end person needed two boxes to be able to join in. And again, that's often where the conversation stops. That's where people think, okay, job done. We're at the point where we get it now. We think we get it and we, we equity, that's the way forward. Um, but one of my favorite panels is actually the bit that's still left is, is justice. What if there was a way um, that it didn't matter at all? 
instead of buying those three boxes, you just got a new fence. And ultimately, that's all that needed to be done. But, you know, in this particular example, people playing football, people not being able to see it. Um, people were so tied up again in the idea of legislation and equality and thinking about what people actually not thinking about actually sorry not thinking about what people actually needed which in the third example it might have cost a little bit more money it might have cost uh, it might have taken a bit more time but ultimately the, that as a process is how i see what i do with with, with companies with, with businesses with charities with everybody that i work with we we talk about what equality means we go into equity and then we finally get to a point a plan for the future that is is equitable um, the other bit I like to talk about is that accessibility isn't just about disabled people. Again, this is thing of where time and time again, clients have said, well, we've not had anybody in a wheelchair come into my coffee shop, which is great. But why do you think that is? That's not. And then we'll, we'll talk about it and it'll be sort of well, the doors aren't wide enough or the door doesn't stay open long enough or worse, there's a step. So, of course, you're not going to have people like me wheeling themselves in because we can't. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of statistics around um, disabled people, rather than raise awareness of this, will simply go elsewhere. Um, again, pulling from anecdotal evidence, um, I remember back in um, Deaf Church, which I used to go to in um, way back in Newcastle, was the idea that we would all go to Starbucks and then one day Starbucks had a new staff and they didn't know what to do. So I ended up having to translate and stand at the front and translate everybody's coffee order. Nobody wins in that scenario, but the baristas didn't know what to do. Um, as a result of that, pretty much every deaf person, so there's a, probably about 60 or so people associated with that group, simply stopped going to Starbucks. It, it actually happened. Starbucks, I mean, I know 60 customers isn't a lot to somewhere like Starbucks, but actually, if, if you think about your business or your charity or whatever you do, um, the idea is that, yeah, just that one little incident led to 60 people stopping completely, changing their behaviors completely. Um, instead, they got a Costa, which, you know, in my experience, Costa, the, I like the coffee less, but the training is better. The people are better. Um, I can wheel up in Costa, they'll take my order and they, they'll bring it out to your table. There's, you know, that's the way it should be. I'm not getting special treatment. They say that to all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons. You could be a mum with a really big buggy and they will do the same thing. Um, I'm going to quickly try and spin up through these. But the idea is that um, when I say that it's not just about disabled people, what I also come back to is something that um, lots of big companies like Microsoft are, are buying into. And it's the idea that any anybody that you work with anybody that you come across is only temporarily abled. Now it's scary to some people, but whether it's age, whether it's an accident, whether it's um, a disease, whether it's whatever it could be, million and one reasons, um, you simply just, you know, people are living longer, therefore are getting more age related disabilities and chronic pains and illnesses. But then there's another bit to that, which I like, which is you can be permanently disabled. In this example, only have one arm, you can be temporarily disabled by breaking an arm, a collarbone, having a cast, needing a sling. And then you have situational, which is you're holding a baby or you're just holding a coffee. There's loads of reasons why somebody won't have access to two of their hands. So you can whiz through a couple of suggestions. If you're creating an app or a service or a website, and people often use their phones, if you can't use it adequately with one hand, you didn't just lose the customer who was permanently disabled you'd lost everybody who was temporarily disabled and you lost everybody who was ever holding a coffee cup or holding a baby or carrying shopping. There's just so many scenarios where the conversation may start about disability, accessibility and inclusion, but actually it's just being better for everybody. Um, another quick example is blindness. Um, but yes, you can be permanently blind. Um, I have vision issues myself that will deteriorate but you can be temporary. It can be a cataract. It could be pink eye. It could be an infection. It could be anything situational. Again, it could be distracted driving. It could be something simple as the sun glare just shining in your face while you're trying to 
Are you trying to do something? Excuse me. Again, that could be somebody shopping in a shop. You know, the idea is that if you if you got your shop set up in a nice and all the bright lights and lots of shiny things, you're not, you know, it's not an attractive space. It might be a trendy space, but it isn't an attractive one and it isn't an accessible one. Um, and then just a couple of things that I've worked with some previous clients with. Um, the idea is that everything's moving online now. So, uh, okay, there was a quick update there. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, so everyone's moved online. So a lot of talks, a lot of questions that I was getting were around making online events more accessible. So the big one is lighting. Um, I'm going to see if I can quickly do a live demonstration to show you the point. But it's like right now, this is me live and I've just turned out my lights. You can't see me anymore. But this is how people will do talks. This is how I've seen professors at universities. I'll put this back on. Um, professors at universities give talk as recently as Thursday where they look like they're in a, just a black room. But it doesn't it doesn't need to be that way. And you don't need fancy lights. Just even um, even a lamp behind the camera or at least behind your screens will will help keep your face nice and clear. And the less work a camera has to do, the better you'll look. Now that doesn't work if you have a face like mine, but everybody here is beautiful and amazing and you all look so much better than I do. So don't worry about it. You'll look great. The next one is audio over video. So people will forgive if, if you're on a slightly older camera or if maybe your webcam isn't performing very well, but a big thing is audio. Uh, it's audio, yes, for hard of hearing, for, for deaf people like myself, um, but really you don't need to go and spend a lot of money and get nice fancy microphone equipment, just get a clip-on. Um, my clip-on mic is not on my desk, so I can't show you, but they are very, um, very inexpensive and they plug into anything. Um, and there's a clip on your shirt, so you can do exercises in them, you can do, you know, you can do all sorts, and you can get them about 15 foot long. If you really need to just sprint around in a room, you can do that, and you can have better sound. Um, a big one is captions. Now, there are loads of ways to put captions um, onto things. Unfortunately, Zoom, Zoom made a weird decision where they, they added this feature to add in captions, but then they don't handle the captions themselves. So Microsoft um, Teams and Google, is it either Google Video or Google Meets, I forget what it's called now, but they have built in subtitles managed by the platforms themselves. What Zoom said was if you pay for our expensive versions, you can get the ability to add in captions, but you then have to go and pay somebody else to put in those captions. And so it wasn't really a move towards accessibility, unfortunately. Um, it was more about putting up costs and profit, which obviously they, they did massively um, in the lockdown. But after the fact, you can, you know, you can get YouTube will transcribe your videos and give you a subtitle transcript for free. All you have to do is upload it to YouTube, um, don't publish it, and then you can get subtitles for absolutely any video you want. It doesn't even have to be yours. Um, there are times where I've taken people's videos, <laughs> added subtitles to them, and sent it back, and just been like, you forgot to do this bit. You forgot to make it accessible. You forgot to add captions. Um, something that I tried to do even for today um, was I sent out the PDFs ahead of time. So that meant that people could, if they needed to, have access to my slides before, before they need them, and then take a break. So today we're not going to be going on for too long, but if we were, I would have scheduled in just a quick break. Call it a comfort break, call it a coffee break, or whatever you need. Um, close that window. Um, yes. So we've got another quick one here with somebody's example of some um, Instagram posts. Again, this is a really easy way to start. Lots of people are fond of putting out quotes, but or just quotes or fancy words or inspiration. I, I don't I don't like them. I don't know why, but people people do this everywhere. And what they forget is to either add the alt text um, or to repeat what the picture says in the image description. Other big things are screen readers or oh, emoji spam, which is a big thing. Um, I don't think the sound is going to work on this. I'll, I'll check it now. But essentially, a screen reader to read that sentence will say heart smile emoji, dog emoji, dog emoji, dog emoji, heart smile emoji. We think dogs are hashtag mint. And then again, heart emoji, heart face emoji, dog, 
dog, dog emoji, half face emoji. It's when screen readers, which um, help obviously uh, people who need it to to read out the screen. But yeah, there are loads of traps that people fall into with with this sort of thing. Um, another quick one is um, hashtags, something called camel case, which is every word should be separated. So we've got some examples here, kind of funny ones. We've got Amazon's hit car show, which reads as Amazon's car show. But that's not what they mean. We've mm -hmm. got children's slaughter. Obviously, they mean children's laughter, but nobody's, I hope, slaughtering children or posting memes or posting tweets about it. So you've got now Thatcher's dead, which um, when Margaret Thatcher passed away, um, a lot of people in America thought that Cher had died. Because again, now that Cher's dead is also now Thatcher's dead. And so it's, you know, it's not just about these sort of funny miscommunications. Um, it is easier for everybody to read when you split them up. Um, so other thing. Sorry, sorry, oh, yeah. to you. Just to, sorry to interrupt you there, Dean. Um, it came up saying that they've, ex they've took off the, the, the uh, time limit so you can just carry on. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this is another thing that I've done with... Um, so whereas the other ones have been with everybody from charities, uh, so all of this is done with just everybody, um, businesses, business groups, um, some training people, and just everybody who uses social media, this bit I've worked more with um, designers, people who are putting together brand guidelines, people who are um, creating content, creating online content for just about everybody. Um, fun fact here is um, my middle name is, well, my other middle name is Buster. So my full name, unfortunately, even on my birth certificate, is Dean Buster Frank Reynolds. Now, for some reason, I took the Buster part off when I started a business. I don't know why, maybe it was just, yeah, I didn't want to get people to get the wrong idea. Um, so in this sort of mock-up, there's there's no place that I know of called Buster's Bistro, but there might be. So this is one of the examples I use with um, designer clients where we talk about how contrast is, is more important than anything else when it comes to design. It doesn't matter if it's for a website, it doesn't matter if it's for print, it doesn't matter really whatever happens with that bit of content, contrast is, is king. Um, in the number one example, we've gone for all of designers favorite trends, which is gray. Everybody loves gray, different shades of gray. Maybe there are 50 shades of gray, I wouldn't know. But yeah, you've got, you've got gray. Gray on white is a huge, huge trend. And it's really low contrast, it's hard to see. Um, and that doesn't, again, doesn't just mean people with vision issues or vision impairments. Doesn't just mean people with screen readers. It literally means everybody. It's just literally everyone has a problem, is, has to work harder to see gray on white. Uh, in the middle example, we've gone for a kind of pastel colors, which were all the rage sort of around about mid last year. Um, and from a design view, that, that's fine. People will get that as their content. They'll get templates off the internet or their designers, if they've got them, will will come up with a brief like that. But again, that doesn't meet contrast standards. And then finally, the third example, we've gone for a dark color with a light text on top. And it's just that simple. That is the easiest for your eyes to see, to read and to comprehend. And that's the same for everybody. And a big common problem that people fall into with accessibility and just such a small scale as this is the idea that, well, I don't know where to start and I don't know what to do and I just do as I'm told. And from from, from web developers to graphic designers and everyone in between that I've, that I've worked with and spoken with, the idea is that the, the customers, the clients think that the designers, web or otherwise, know about this stuff and then the web designers and the graphic designers and the design agencies think that if this was an important part, then the clients would have said, we need to make sure that this is accessible. So there's this huge sort of assumption and just gap in knowledge and awareness. Other little things, font choice. Um, there are serif fonts, which are the ones that look all squiggly and have little bumps on them and look very old fashioned. Um, they they certainly have a, a place, but they shouldn't be used everywhere. Um, 
sans serif it's just nice and modern and rounded shapes then there's unique fonts which that one there open dyslexic is i want to say sweden swedish company danish company somewhere they, they put together and it doesn't work for everybody and that's not the point of accessibility time and time again i'll say that there's no one size fits all but it, that is a font that gets rid of some of the waiting errors between common letters that people with dyslexia um, will face so d's and b's and p's and q's they're weighted differently so again anyone's brain not just people with dyslexia have to work less hard to scan the word and see what it is um i'm just i'll quickly like to end on some funny stories or not so funny stories um you know it doesn't matter how big or small you are as a business there are any of the things I mentioned, nothing has been high level, nothing has been, you know, it might seem that way, but really we're talking about using social media properly, adding alt text to images and being mindful. That's all we've really spoken about today. Um, and it doesn't matter what size you are. Um, got some two quick stories to end on um, about how the big guys don't always get it right. So I think it might've been early pandemic, Domino's, not Domino's UK, but Domino's in America, were in the middle of being sued because you couldn't order a pizza with a screen reader or with assistance on your phone, screen reading assistance on your phone. And there was a long drawn out case and Domino's at one point tried to get sympathy by turning around and saying, well, it will cost us about, I think I want to say it was about $60,000 to make these changes. And rather than people saying, oh, that's unreasonable, Everybody came out and said, yeah, that sounds about right. Like you are a multi-million pound business. Why are you taking this to court after court after court? Um, it went up to the Supreme Court in America. And now you just, you're telling us that you're doing this for $60,000. It, it's, it's no money to you guys. And unfortunately that case was, it was thrown out. But appeals were, were um, held back because of things like um, coronavirus and you know the, the presidential elections and all of that. So that hasn't come to a firm conclusion yet, but yeah, to massive companies with millions and millions of dollars international and they just, they just didn't get it um, at all. And then quickly last one on, on Netflix, Marvel, and obviously now Disney, and it's being a massive nerd, it, it's fun. But if you don't know, there's a blind superhero called Daredevil and um, he has an accident as a child, injures his eyes, and he is blind. And he grows up and he learns, you know, it's a comic book, there's going to be some comic book elements, and essentially he learns to, um, I guess, be a ninja is the quick way to sum it up. He's just, yeah, he can, he can use things like a little bit like echolocation and spatial awareness, and he's really good at, and essentially becomes a superhero, despite the fact that he can't see. Um, so Netflix and Marvel and Disney work together on, I think there are three or four seasons in total, but the first season of, of Daredevil, so this Netflix, Disney, Marvel show with literally millions and millions of pounds put into it about a blind superhero launched without audio description. So at no point did any of these multi-billion dollar franchises think that blind people might enjoy a superhero story about a blind man so it doesn't matter what size business you are it just, you know the big there's no such thing as too big to fail when it comes to accessibility you know there are these mistakes and these goofs are you know everywhere um you know bad branding bad color bad advertising choices bad actors in tv shows it, it is unfortunately a universal problem but it's something that i'm passionate about raising awareness to and actually helping anybody who's interested get better at it. Um, and then again, just proving time and time again that it's not about spending hundreds of millions of pounds. If you can, great, but you can do a lot for free. You can do a lot with what you already have. And yeah, you don't need to be owned by a mouse overlord to do any of it. You can do it all on your own as an independent charity, as a sole trader, as somebody who just wants to ultimately be reach, reach a wider, wider audience of customers or clients, and then 
ultimately make more money, be seen more online and be part of good, good business going forward. So thank you for that. And yeah, sorry for rambling. No, <laughs> I told you I was very good at rambling. <laughs> no, that's brilliant, Dean. That was uh, really top-notch stuff. Very impressed. Very impressed. Yeah. Yeah, thank so, you. Do you. Any questions from the people we have? Obviously, I'm happy to answer anything in comments on the recording, but for now, is there any questions from you guys? Yeah, I was going to say, what's probably the most rewarding part of your work? I, I think... I think it's the moment that people get it. You know, it's the bit where, you know, some, some amazing clients have said some really nice things um, about how I make it real. Because these designers and the, these, you know, really intelligent people who literally can, you know, code entire worlds into video games and really exciting things. It's not that they're not aware. It's not that they don't know. It's just that they, they don't know how to start and they're afraid to start. So for me, I think it's that moment where people get it. And they kind of, there's an almost a bit where they think it can't be that easy. And it's almost like it, yeah, it really can be, you know, yes, you know, I can, I can help people work. Um, I have one client and we're looking at a roadmap for, I think we're about five years from now. Um, some things happen quicker than others, but ultimately there's a five year roadmap. Um, and that includes a new website. Um, that includes taking on somebody to do more work. Um, they're a bit of an agency themselves, but it's almost like a, yeah, I remember working with a lady for this agency and it was the idea that she thought that it was going to cost millions. She was just so distraught and she was like, I work with disabled people. I don't want to not be accessible. I don't want people to, to have all of those interactions with me and think that I either don't care or I'm, you know, just simply not be able to get in contact with me. So for her, there was just one meeting and she was like, oh God, is that it? And it was like, what do you mean? And it was like, is, is that it? And I'm like, well, yeah, that was our three month plan. That was what we're gonna do together in the next three months. And then obviously, you know, I, I'm not saying that I have to work with somebody for five years, that's not true, but you know, she, she wanted to look ahead. But I think as good as it was, putting that roadmap together and, and working with her on, you know, because it comes into things like business and forecasting and all of that. Everybody forecasts for when you do certain things, but nobody forecasts on when they're going to be accessible, when they're going to start to reach a better audience, when they're going to start to to have more customers and more money coming in. They just kind of, they ignore that bit. Um, but yeah, for, I think for me, it's just, it's just the bit where people realize that it's possible, I think, and it's not scary. <laughs> yeah. oh, brilliant. brilliant. Do, do you have any uh, questions, Carol? <laughs> Yeah, can I take you back to subtitles? Yeah. So with my dog training videos, I spent hours and hours and hours re-subtitling YouTube because the, sub the automatic subtitles are obviously not as good. Yeah. So do people cope with the automatic subtitling? Because with the vlogging I'm doing at the moment, I'll be honest, there's no subtitles on them at all right now. Um, because I just haven't had the time to re-subtitle it. Um, so would it be better putting the automated ones on that I've kind of avoided till now because I hate them so much myself? Um, no, I, I understand that. And it's, I think, again, some people will have different opinions, but as somebody who needs the subtitles on those videos, I'd much rather have have even a starting point to be able to keep up with you. You know, it doesn't need to be Hollywood level productions with, you know, proper, you know, amazing subtitles on all of these, you know, it doesn't have to be anywhere near that. Um, <clears throat> for me, I would, yeah, I'd much rather have what's available by YouTube that you can might you might be able to come back and do it. You might be able to, you know, you might be able to add them in. Um people think that, well, oh, what's the point in captioning a video from even three or four years ago? And it's like, well, video lasts forever. Just because you post it on there, posting it on your YouTube channel, people will continue to find it. And um particularly for YouTube, um same for other video channels as well, but specifically YouTube, because it is so big. If you don't subtitle videos, YouTube has no real way of knowing what that video is about. 
as mm -hmm. well. So it's not only are you helping people like me, but if you choose not to go through and click it, and even if you don't tidy it up that much or at all, you're still confirming to YouTube that actually my video is about this. Um, yeah. So it's all about robots on the other end. There's no, you know, there's there's nobody who could possibly sit there and watch every video uploaded to YouTube every day and tick a box. It's all done by computers. And yeah, so there's loads of reasons why even even the the craptions, which is I, I didn't um, I didn't come up with that term, but I'm going to steal it from a from a friend. Um, so so Merrill says craptions and it, it is yeah. they are craptions. They're not great. And everybody knows that, but they're better than nothing. And, yeah. you know, it's it's not just about being better for, for people like us. It's about for being better for you as well and your channel and your views and, yeah, being found. And if you do find a spare day or if you're really committed and you maybe want to put in one day's work a month, just to go back for an afternoon, have a coffee, have a chill, do whatever makes you feel good and just go back and start to fix some of them. Yeah. And then just stop after some time after you finished your coffee, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't ever have to be an all in one done. I'm not going to say stop working, stop existing, stop living, go back and fix all your subtitles. Now you're terrible. That's just not, the, that's not how the world works. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so that would be my advice. Put the, put the basic ones up, accept that they're not perfect, but they're better than nothing. And then, yeah, if you want to set some time aside, go back and just, yeah, work for half an hour, take a break go out with the dogs, play. If I had the dog in my room, I wouldn't get any work done. So that's that's why he has to stay downstairs while I work. But um, but yeah, so for stuff like that, you can always go back. But for YouTube, especially for video, it, it's important that it gets it gets fixed at some point. But yeah, even corruptions is better than nothing. So my next question yeah. is where, and it's a council, not a company, but where an organization has messed up, with mm -hmm. their access and to fix it would be expensive. And I'll give you an example from yesterday. Mm -hmm. We've got, I'm, I'm in Carlisle and we've got new flood defences and they're finally opening up now. So yeah. the route over the flood defences at what is arguably the town's main park is about a one in four. And so rather than them weaving it down the flood defence, yeah. they've gone straight down. <laughs> so there's just Now, like... most of them, they've done it right. Like the ones local to me, they have actually done it and they've done it with the little platforms and everything, and I can do it. The one down in town is literally, I went down it yesterday and I was scared going down. I was scared of sliding out my chair going down it. Yeah. I've never have got up it in a million years. No. Um, and I'm strong as hell. I mean, I do marathon distances. So, um, and it's like, how do you challenge something where an organized, without going to war with them, for want of a better phrase, um, but where they've already put the investment in and messed up? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's, just, there's, there's nothing quite as drastic as that. But, um, you know, what I try to do, if it's a private business, is approach them as a private person. You know, I'm approaching them as a potential customer, a potential client, and arguably it's easier because I'm not there doing what I do for a day job. Um, there's a, you know, there's, there was a, again, back when you could go to restaurants, there was a time where a restaurant did something similar with, with access. And it was sort of, I, I could go to them as a, as, as a play, you know, as, as a paying customer and go, this isn't good. This isn't great. Um, and I didn't even mention being my day job. I didn't mention all of this. I was just there as somebody who's like, I want to give you my money, but I can't give you my money. This is the reason why. And um, I went back about a month later and they fixed it. It was, it, was a, it was a step. So they had a graded slope all the way up, nothing like what you're describing, unfortunately. And there was a step. So I could get all the way up and it was beautiful. And then it was like, <laughs> but I can't get in. And the irony is they had a disabled toilet. <laughs> an accessible toilet right on the inside and so yeah 100 percent. it's easier when it's something like that and my advice would always be to yeah not go to war um i don't know it's it's tricky um councils in my experience and i am being really general um 
they probably won't do anything until they have to. That is, you know, and obviously I'm in no way saying that, yeah, you should try it and hurt yourself and then, then they'll sharp get it done. But that's the sad reality. Um, and I think raising it with local MPs, with, with local councillors and being a voice, but a, not not what people expect you to be, not, not the raging voice, not going yeah. to war, but raising awareness of it is the much better. And that, that's, that's my way of doing it. Um, you know, with, you know, I, I've said things like use a carrot, not a stick. So, you know, it's the idea that, you know, I can say, well, I can't give you my money. I can't come here for birthday parties. I can't do things. It's easier to do with a business than it is to do with a council. And I think the way to do it with a council, um, Carlisle, so I don't know, don't know what might be available in your area, but um, I know that at least in, in and around Newcastle, there are a lot of groups attached to things like universities who do um, studies around aging. Um, in Newcastle, we have literally the, the international, um, not the international, the National um, Innovation Centre for Aging. And, you know, they would be the kinds of people as well to kind of bring awareness to it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a slow, slow moving, slow moving thing. Um, it's, it's frustrating as hell. Um, you know, I, uh, long story short, I can't get out of my own house without assistance. Um, and because I have more than 140 pounds a week to my name, I can't get help getting any adaptations to my home. So in that days like today, I'm stuck upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, I can't, yeah. So it's not a been fun there. position to be in. Yeah, and it's just, yeah, you know, it's you, get, you, you get frustrated and you get angry and it's easy to get trapped in that cycle and it's easy to to have that same cycle with something like, um, you know, with some, with some physical problems like, like a ridiculously vertical ramp. And obviously, I really don't know how that got signed off. As you'll know, there's about 50 different people that have to sign up on that. And at least two of them will be getting paid the big bucks because they went on an accessibility shopping. course. You know, and it's like, how can it you sign up on that? Um, I mean, there are other places around town where that is the case just because of the geography. Yeah. But putting in a new flood defence, it's like... Yeah, putting in something brand saying, new. How? <laughs> um, you know, and there are other places I can think of that... Are, are almost as bad, but they couldn't do anything else. And so yeah. that's what yeah. it is. Um, but there, it's like, it's a brand new thing that it should have been built into in the beginning. Yeah. Um, so whether or not I managed to actually get anywhere with it, but like yesterday I was just like so shocked. <laughs> yeah. Not surprised. It's, yeah, you, you have to bring that, you know, that feeling of, if nobody else, I mean, actually, that's not true. I'm sure lots of people walking on it will have a fear, you know, some sense of safety. And then thankfully we're getting away of away from the bad weather. But yeah, when the ice and the snow come back again, that's not going to be a pleasant experience for anybody going up or down no. that, that much of an incline. Um, no, they'd have to go down. See, the reason that I want to try and address it is you'd have to go down the hill and then back up the hill to go around it. Right, okay, so you, you literally got to do twice as much. You down to the bottom of the hill that you would just have been crossing and have to come back up rather than just cross it and go over the foot defence and down. So the ultimate um, route, you know, which is annoying at the best of times, is then not reasonable in itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, if there are any any local groups, definitely try and get those involved. Um, yeah. But it, it's it's... Yeah, it's an, an, it's the sad yeah. fact of until somebody is injured, it won't be looked at by anybody higher than, you know, the the receptionist who filters emails. Yeah. It's it's anyway. It's thanks for that. That's um, yeah. The uni idea is a good one. I'll I'll look what because we've got nursing and physio courses at the uni, so there may be yeah. something going on. I mean, and it's kind of uni. But uh, it's it's still the idea that it's like it's 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 a place that people miss a lot of the time when it comes to, you know, if they're on about nursing, then it's almost like a, you can always start the conversation and be like, have you seen that hill? Like how many more fractures are you guys going to yeah. have to, you know, like that's a serious concern. You know, it's, you know, yeah. I guess I can say it in a yeah, jokey yeah. way, but, but ultimately it's, it's, it's not just your safety 
And I think that's what a lot of activists kind of, and the more, I don't, not exactly toxic, but the more shouty and wary people kind of miss of where it, they make it personal. And I think what I try and do is to, is to distance myself from it, which is hard, but then just objectively look at something and go, this isn't safe or this isn't accessible. And it's that that's how I approach it. I, I try to, you know, I, I'll use things like humor. I'll use existing groups. So it's not just me and my voice. And I think that's, that's an important thing for anybody. Cause sometimes I feel a bit like, is it just me? Like, am I just moaning because yeah, I have yeah, to go yeah. all the um, way around the block just to get to a drop curb. And it's like, mm -hmm. mm, I don't think it's just me. I think that anybody, chair or uh, a buggy or a you know a big double pram or someone who's an, an older person who's pulling one of those shopping trolleys there's there's a whole range of people that lives are made better by not having ridiculous inclines or in you know in my example having more drop curbs and i think yeah the more people you can the more people you can have that conversation and it not be angry then the more it raises awareness yeah. because all all getting angry and, and starting war does is on in my opinion is it raises your profile and that's not the you know you don't want to be remembered as carol that's that lady fun. who goes on about the hill you want to be like carol the, the lady yeah. who helped us realize that that was unsafe and you know before yeah. somebody had to unfortunately you know suffer an injury so i think mm -hmm. that that's how i would go about it excellent brilliant any more questions, Carol? Or no, it's all right. <laughs> I know. That's, no, no, thank uh, you for letting me ramble. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's been absolutely brilliant. I really do. And uh, also the questions uh, Carol brought up there as well. Um, as Dean mentioned, like for everyone watching the recording, uh, feel free to, as he said, leave some messages in the comments, and I'm sure he'll get back to you on the group yeah. uh, or in, in person. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's it for today. Unfortunately, awesome. thank, thank you very much for your time, both of you. Um, a brilliant, brilliant, uh, brilliant meeting indeed. Yeah, so, really enjoyed it, and looking forward to speaking to you all soon. Thank you very much. I'm just. Gonna